Good morning and welcome to the Department of Literatures in English Cape Lecture Series. My name is Rachelle Mosley Wood and I'm head of the Department of Literatures in English here at Mona UWA. Our department has been providing a Cape Lecture Series for many years and we are delighted to be able to resume after an absence last year. As we adjust to what I like to refer, refer to as Zoom life, we are experiencing some technical difficulties. So I ask for your patience and apologize for the inconvenience as we try to find our online legs. Remember that all the Cape lectures will be posted on the department's YouTube channel and you can access them at your own convenience. Most of our sessions in the series are live. So go ahead and post your questions in the chat when there's a live presenter so that he or she can respond to your questions at the end of the lecture. I hope that by now most of you would have put in your applications to the universities of your choice. And of course, I hope that the UWI is high on your list of targeted institutions. I invite you to visit the Literatures in English website and to take a look at our degree options and course offerings. You might be surprised at what you see. In addition to our long-standing BA in Literatures in English, we also offer the BA Liberal Studies, the BA Film Studies, and our most recent program, the BA Writing, Literature and Publishing. We also offer a creative writing minor. If you have any questions, contact us using the information given on the website. Of course, we'll be very pleased to hear from you and happy to answer any queries that you have. I hope you enjoy the presentations we have lined up, lined up for you this week and next week. And I hope that they're very useful in helping you to prepare for your CAPE exams. When those exams come, good luck. I know you'll do well. Thank you. All right, so hi everyone, and welcome again to the second Cape Lecture Series session. Um, I am Dr. Aisha Spencer, and I will get into introducing myself to you in a moment. I am going to go ahead um, and just share with you what we're going to look at today. And I want you to, to see this as a kind of, unfortunately, you're not in front of me and I'm not in front of you um, in a physical space. But right now I am, I am kind of imagining you there, right? And I want us to really get into understanding what um, the concept of essay writing and literature is about. So I'm happy to be guiding you through this series. Yesterday, I believe you went through on Jen with Miss Celia Sykes. And I hope that really um, motivated you to, to want to really get deeper and deeper into the text. And some of that we'll be touching today. So my focus today is not to get into the texts themselves, um, but to, to guide you through understanding what needs to happen when we look at essay writing and when we look at what is to, to happen with essay writing. Um, I, we're focused on unit one presently and that's important simply because I think most students come from CSEC English B and they're not really ready all the time to jump over and that's what I would call it, a jump over. So there's a bridge that moves from CSEC English B into Cape Literatures in English Unit 1. And very often with essay writing, students tend to not recognize um, the advanced level that happens when we move from CSEC English B to Literatures in English Unit 1. And this applies to Unit 2 students as well. All Unit 2 students can benefit from this. But I want you to really um, have paper and pen in front of you, have your, your phones, you know, your computers, whatever it is that you're using 
really to jot down strategic points, thinking of yourself as we go through this process, because the core of what I'm going to look at today resonates really with you. And you have to find that style that belongs to you, even as we go through the structure of essay writing and all that is involved there. So let's just quickly look at an introduction of myself. Um, you will see the information on the screen, but I'm one of the deputy deans in the Faculty of Humanities and Education, and I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Education, focusing on lang language and literature education. Um, and so I've been teaching literatures in English, teaching literature, looking at that for over 21, 22 years. And my heart is really focused on really helping students to connect, not just with the text, but with the ability to respond to the text. And that's what essay writing is all about. Um, and so I want to start today by helping you to understand that how you write your essay really counts. What you say really counts. It's not simply about, I need to know this text and throw that information out to the examiner. But more importantly, what do I have to say about this text? And how will I be able to relate that to the examiner? Um, as a reader, as somebody who would want to be interested in what I have to say, um, and not simply somebody who is looking to, to give me checkpoints to see that I have this knowledge of the text. And I think sometimes that's where students drop off a little bit and that's where we need to beef up, right? And so in my experience, what tends to happen is students get really focused about talking about the text, but not so much about what is the question asking and what, how do I feel about that question? And um, what am I, how am I going to strategically look at that question? And so as we go through today, I want you to understand that your essays actually really count, right? You have to be strategic about how you write and about what you're writing. You have to choose your information carefully, but you also have to look at how you are writing it carefully. You have to know and understand what the examiner is expecting. So very often when I do workshops across for different students, across different schools, um, different platforms, what I recognize is that some students have never even opened up the CAPE syllabus. They have no clue what the examiner is actually um, requiring of them, expecting of them. Uh, perhaps you look at the list of texts, perhaps you look at um, ensuring that you answer the correct question. But in terms of looking at the objectives, what are the aims? of that syllabus. And in terms of looking at what the, the, the writers have encouraged students to do, many students actually don't look at it. And so think about it. If, if you're going to get a job and you're going in for that interview, you have to know about the company. You have to know what the company is expecting of you, right? And it's the same thing with the exam. You have to recognize that when you write this one essay, it will end up being three over the time, right? For the exam paper. But when you write each essay, that essay says, this is you. That's what you're giving to the examiner as a reflection of, of you. That's all they get of you. They don't get the smiles. They don't get the entertainment the teachers get in the classroom. They don't get to see your persona. They don't get to see when you're upset. They don't get to see the depth of your argument because of your facial expression. All they get to see is an essay and that essay represents you, right? So you really have to sit down and think about well, what is my opinion here? And how am I going to demonstrate to this examiner that I not only have an opinion, I have an informed opinion that's based on my readings of the text, but also my readings of all the different things, opinions, literary critics have given read this text. And I'm going to say, if you look at that third point, you have to practice writing your essays. So this is just before we get into the meat of the matter, that these are really core things that you have to think about as you go into essay writing. Um, people kind of tend to think of practicing with math, practicing with IT, um, practicing with formulae from chemistry or maybe physics. So there is a, a practice mentality that goes with the, um, the, the subjects that are considered mathematical or scientific in nature, but there's tends to be very little practice with the subjects in the arts. The tendency is to think, all I have to do is read and I got it, but let's take a look at that. So we go into the exam room, right? If we can imagine ourselves there, we sit down and we begin to write. We've never done this before. 
We've written essays for assignment pieces. We've written essays for tests at school, okay? And how many times do you do that? All right, perhaps you have one or two tests a month. Uh, some of you might have six weekly tests. Some of you might have it every month. So you may end up having three for the term if you look at that or four, okay? Um, in terms of assignments, you know how that goes, right? So we hurry up and do our assignments because we have all of these different things to do. The, the, the problem is we're very often not highly strategic about what we're doing. And so we don't practice enough. So how do you get across your opinion? What do you tend to do when you're writing your introduction? How long does it take you to come up with some points? How long does it take you to figure out what the question is actually asking? And we're going to look at some of that today. Those things are important. You have to know yourself because every single student is different and every one of you will approach essay writing in a different way. So not only do you have to know about the essay itself and the structure, which is what we tend to focus mostly on, and we will look at that today, but you also have to know the expectations of the examiner and you also have to know about yourself, right? And one of the things you have to do is keep practicing so that you will have an idea of where your weaknesses are and where your strengths are. Uh, what you need to build on as we go along, right? But if you do it for the first time in the exam, there are certain things you will try to do for the first time, you're going to have issues there, all right? Um, and so you need to know how to um, effectively utilize certain writing techniques. And we will look at that as we go through. And these writing techniques that I will be looking at will really be centered on the literary. We tend again to look only on language and language use, which is important and we'll, we'll go to that. But there's a lot of literary that, um, knowledge that is left out when we look at just essay writing on a whole in literature. So out of the Cape Literature is an English syllabus in the rationale, um, and I'm hoping many of you have read it, okay? <laughs> but I'm also sure some of you haven't. Go and check it out. Actually look at the things that are written in this syllabus about what the expectation is because that expectation is of you and you're able to match that expectation if you know what is there. So to study literature, it says, we have to understand how the human imagination, the creative faculty works as it responds to diverse experience experiences. So, so if you look at what that statement is saying, what you recognize is one of the things that is highly valued in your essay writing is going to be how you look at this text that you have been given and begin to just pull out all the depths of meaning that is embedded within that text. Um, how, how has the writer gotten these things across? Um, you know, what are the techniques that have been used? How does the meaning in this text relate to the world, relate to the issues that we have around us? How am I going to engage with that? So in other words, the text is not simply this product that you kind of take a knife and fork approach at and say, let me get at this and let me get at this. That's not what it's about. The text is about getting all of this rich meaning about life and then trying to ascertain or determine, how do I engage with that? What are my feelings on that? And this one little statement, as simple as it may seem to you, is really saying that if we're going to study literature, we're going to really look at all the possibilities that exist coming out of what somebody may choose to write about. And people can write about absolutely anything. The human imagination is limitless, all right? So as you begin to think about writing, I want you to move away from thinking about this monotonous, mundane, okay, here I go introduction, mm -hmm. I got my thesis statement, I got, try to move away from seeing it as that only. That structure is important, but it's important as it frames your experience of the text, how you feel about it. And the fact is that how you feel about it is going to determine the type of response that you give to it. So what you're seeing in and of the text would be based on a combination of things, right? And I want to look at just quickly. So your own opinion has to be there. And a lot of people have this issue of right or wrong, okay? We, we don't talk about being right or wrong. We really talk about a valid or an invalid response. And that's the truth because all of us can have these different interpretations, all right? So when you go to the, the exam and the, go to the question of essays, the first thing you need to do is, is relax in the sense of 
recognizing that, hey, if I have an opinion of this text and I can support it with textual evidence and I have even more information based on what others have written about this text, that's what we call literary criticism here now, right? And if I have, if I pull those all together, I can present an argument. I can present a case. Now, here is where you need to be careful, particularly those of you in unit one. You need to be careful because the tendency when we hear the word argument is to go back to English A and think of an argument in terms of a persuasive argument. Now, that's going to be a bit problematic. It is an argument and it is kind of trying to convince the reader of your opinion, but there is much more to it that's on the literary side that students tend not to realize. So there's certain core things that you have to know about literature, about the genre that you're doing, certain themes, certain characteristics and styles, certain techniques, certain things about characterization, the text, what others have said about the text, the literary theory that exists on the text, all of these different things help to formulate your opinion. So you can't just throw in your opinion because the fact is, you have your opinion and I have my opinion. Who says that we're right? Who says that that's valid? The only thing that's really going to show that is how I interact with all the material at hand and say to you, listen, you may not agree with me and you may never have seen this before, but I'm going to show you this line of argument. And here is my evidence for saying this. And others have also said this. And you begin to engage with it in such a way that you begin to produce a response that causes somebody to say, hmm, I never thought of that before. You know, come back again with that. That kind of reaction is what you really want from the examiner. The examiner is a human being too, right? And you want to keep that examiner sustained and interested in what you have to say. So you want to move away from thinking of it like a robot and just making sure you have all of these things. The structure is important, but your style is just as important. And we'll come to that in a, in a minute. So the opinion of other literary critics is really crucial. And I find that very often students just haven't read. So you kind of get into a situation I've had unit two students for example they would come and ask so you know I really poured my my all out in unit one I gave it everything and I ended up with a grade four how does that happen I know this text I have an opinion so you have an opinion but how have you engaged with the opinion of others on whatever it is that you're looking at whichever text it is you're looking at and then not just the text overall, but the different issues in the text. So for example, one literary critic might focus on a particular text and look at the techniques in that text, look at the style of writing in that text, may focus on the fact that this writer is forever using um, sound devices, onomatopoeia and alliteration. And, and that tends to be because of the background of the writer who would have come from a certain um, type of home where, you know, um, sound played an important part in his or her upbringing, and we could go on. And so what you have is a literary critic giving an, an opinion on a particular aspect of the text. Somebody else might come and talk about a social issue in the text. What's the point? The point is the more you inform yourself of these various opinions, as the more information you're providing for yourself outside of your own opinion, that is helping to broaden and widen and and deepen your ability to respond to the text. So I find that students don't tend to look at this enough. And I'm going to bring up something that I know a lot of you will smile at right now, right? Just because you're guilty, okay? So one of the things is the use of spark notes, for example, or cliff notes. Nothing is wrong with the use of spark notes or cliff notes. Something is wrong with the use of them thinking, with you thinking that that's the only opinion that exists. What exists in smart notes or cliff notes or any notes, right, that I put before you as an opinion, yes, of somebody as they analyze the text. There's no problem reading that and, and, and getting that as part of your information, but it is what that second point says. It's the opinion of somebody else, okay? So as you're reading it, you're kind of taking it on not as the thing and the only thing that can be said, but if you're going to look at the theme of prejudice, then you're going to say, okay, these are the different things that have been written about prejudice. Let's say we want to really study in a very um, structural way. 
and realistic way, okay? So we can't read everything, and you know the internet has a wealth of information. We can't read any everything. So let's say we're going to look at three particular literary critics, and we look and we jot down what those three particular literary critics have said about the theme of prejudice as it relates to this particular author and the representation of, of this theme in that author's work, all right? Having done that, I then begin to look at that material myself. And I think, well, you know, um, I feel this way about how the theme is represented. What you have done is joined your opinion with others to develop an informed response. That takes practice. So as you go through and as you prepare for this exam, begin to do that. Begin to look at the notes you have. Begin to look at what different people have said. By the time you get into the exam and you're beginning to write, what will happen is you won't have to sit down there racking your brain, trying to figure out just one point to go forward. You'll have several points. And the examiner will see your ability to engage with those different points. Some may be for your argument, some may be against your argument. You don't need to, to shove away the ones that are against your argument simply because they, it enhances your argument or your discussion when somebody can see that you know both sides of the coin and you're able to produce that. And that's depending, of course, on what the question is asking. Sometimes it's only asking for one side of the coin. Other times it's asking you to kind of play out both sides, right? But it's always good to approach your essay in a way that has you looking at both sides, has you showing that you have that information. And then you get into critical conversations, which offer contextual information. So for example, you start your essay. I've seen situations where you have your essay going and you have your introduction, for example, and the student gets straight into the poem or the prose fiction piece or the drama, the play, and starts talking without mentioning the author, without mentioning the writer or the poet or the playwright. How do we do that? We have to establish the context. Not only that, as you're writing, and, and let us say you're writing, we did, um, we looked at Aunt Jen yesterday, let us say you're talking about Aunt Jen. Have you gone into the biographical information for the author? Not only that, have you looked at the era of time? The presentation yesterday would have touched on the, the, the whole idea of the time frame in which that was set, the idea of the different um, landscapes that are at work, the different types of people that are present. You have to know all of that information historically, socially, culturally, in order to begin to understand how the character is operating in the text and why things might affect the character, right? So the examiner can pick up when you have that contextual information. Again, I don't want you to see it robotically. It's not a matter, okay, let me show them that I know all of this. We are expecting <laughs> that you would know all of that, right? So everybody expects that you would know that. Your teachers, um, the examiners, everybody that you, is involved in this process would have expected that you know these things. What they're looking for is how you're gonna use it to engage them in an argument in a way that's effective, that they come away feeling, boy, this student dealt with this piece, right? So that's something you want to consider. So we're going to explore writing essays on the different genres, because I think it's important that as part of the essay writing, that you look at the fact that you, you're writing um, structurally, the essay format will not change. But in terms of how you look at it and how you approach it and the content that you utilize, it's going to change according to genres. And sometimes students don't recognize that. And the syllabus actually speaks quite heavily to being able to differentiate among the genres. So you have to show the examiner that you know the difference among poetry, prose, and plays and drama, right? And that you're able to utilize the different types of language. So we'll come to that. Addressing challenges with writing essays. So in my work with students, one of the things I love to do is just capture the types of things they will say. And so we look at some, just three um, challenges today based on the time. Just um, look at the ways in which um, we can address three main challenges that students tend to have when they're writing essays. And then we'll just look at three basic but important things to consider when you're writing your essay. And I've kind of hinted one of them is a strategy, but we'll look at three other S's, three other words that you need to look at when you think of really presenting your, your essay and remembering that that essay you, you, you represent 
that's you. That's all the examiner gets of you, right? So it's really key that they get the best of you. So let's look at category one and let's look at this idea of genres. So very often students will write about what the poem is about, about what the prose fiction text is about, whether it's a novel or, or, or short story, whatever students are doing in that particular um, genre or the drama, the play. And so the focus tends to be so much on what it is about that students tend to neglect how the what is presented. I hope I haven't lost you there, right? So the what deals with things like themes and issues and, and the concerns that are in the text, you know, the literal what of the story, um, who is this character and um, what is being portrayed here? What's the situation that's going on? But then you also have this idea of how. Now, because of how our brains work, we are not necessarily sitting and saying, okay, how did the writer just do that? And, and how did the poet just get that across? We're not saying that, but literally the meanings that we are getting are we are receiving because of the how, right? So when you stop and think about it and say, all right, let's consider this process. It's like kind of walking to, to school, taking a bus, um, driving in a car. You kind of know, like, they call it automatic processing in psychology, right? So you kind of go through those motions. What needs to happen with your essay writing as you begin to think is you need to start breaking down that automatic processing, all right? How did this happen? So, so when I started to feel as though this character like really needs help, something is wrong with this girl, right? When I start thinking that, what has caused me to think that? It, it's really the presentation of the character. And so if I go back again, if it's the presentation of the character, then it's something to do with how that character is being formed and, and structured by the writer. Um, how are characters different? Why is it that we respond to this character this way? And we don't respond to that character the other way. And of course, that has to do with characterization details, right? Um, the speech of the character, the dialogue, the conversation, the type of tones that are utilized, the way they, they engage with other characters or the ways that they, they have relationships in the text. Um, you know, what they choose to, how, how the narrative describes them in terms of their clothing, et cetera. And we could go on. The bottom line is, that's how. And then when we get into looking at the genres, how it happens in poetry is often different from how it happens in prose, is often different from how it happens in the play. Have you captured that? Have you captured that when you're writing your essay? One of the ways you can capture that is through your use of vocabulary, okay? So vocabulary matters. You utilize words associated with each genre. Think about it. So let me give you an example. Let's look at this writing about a genre. So <clears throat> if we go to literary devices, forms of drama, elements, <clears throat> forgive me, of drama, features of drama, notice what is happening there on the screen. These are all categories that have been placed by the syllabus. It means you have to know these categories, not just to know them to kind of answer a multiple choice question, but to be able to write about it. So think about that. So as I'm writing about a tragic comedy, as I'm writing about a romance or a comedy or a tragedy, um, as I write about that for plays, have I utilized certain types of vocabulary when I'm writing? How have I done that if I've done it? Have I utilized the words like soliloquy and monologue to demonstrate that I know the features of drama? Right, And we're going to look at just the different ways that students can write. Um, coming from <clears throat> a, a, a quick sample, really, um, looking at how one student can write, um, can have all the knowledge in the world and write an essay that is deemed more sophisticated in language use and in presentation of literary knowledge than another student. So let's go back up. All right. Um, you will also need to relate the form of the genre to the contents, to the themes or issues being presented. This is something, again, that students only tend to do for certain things. And I've looked, if you look in brackets there, you see the sonnet. So the sonnet is a good example, right, of how students tend to look at form. Um, students tend to see form very quickly when they have been asked to focus on the form of particular 
types of poems, right? Um, and so it kind of jumps out. Oh, yes, I can look at the sonnet for that. And it has 14 lines and there are two types of sonnets. And we go on in that way. But think about it again, going back to what I just said, remembering that how, that how is very important. When you're dealing with form or structure, you're dealing with the how of the text, okay? How does it happen? How does meaning come across? You have to represent that in your essays, right? So you can't simply speak about the theme. You can't sp simply talk about the fact that um, racism is present in this text. You have to also negotiate with how. That's what the syllabus means when it talks about the relationship between form and content. Let's go here. <clears throat> so when we're looking at the taming of the shrew, right, which is on the unit one syllabus, for example, let's talk about the induction scene. You have this induction scene at the start, right? And you have what has been popularly um, known as the framing device, okay? So you don't want to only focus on what Christopher Sly is doing in the taming of the shrew. You want to also be able to focus on structurally what's happening. You want to do the two things in a balanced way because the examiner is expecting you to demonstrate to them that relationship between content, what Christopher Sly is doing, and the framing device. Why did Shakespeare use that? Why is that even there? Why is it placed at the start and then we continue in the way we do? Is there a reason for that? And we are gonna say there's a reason, right? And so the idea is, what is that reason? It does it mean that there is one definitive reason? Absolutely not. What it means is that there's the possibility that there is meaning connected there and you have to tap into that. So the examiner is likely to know that, right? but you have to show the examiner that you're thinking of that, okay? So this is another way in which genre specific um, ideas are important because what you're doing when you speak of the framing device, what you're doing when you speak of that induction scene and the way that that part of the play relates to the whole of the play is you're beginning to speak about the genre of drama. You're beginning to bring in terms like audience, Okay, as opposed to reader, you don't want to use the term reader when you're talking about drama, because drama is meant to be performance, right? And so we're meant to read it as performance, even though we unfortunately don't get to see it that way, right? If we lived in kind of England or those places where that's common day practice. We could go to the globe. We don't have the globe here, but we do have the, the pantomime going on. We do have the theater. COVID has killed that for now, but we expect those things will come back. But, you know, you can go on YouTube and you can see all of the different varieties of plays now. You have access to all of that. The bottom line is, if drama is performance, you can't speak of this induction scene like it's just a, a part of a narrative in a prose fiction piece, right? Or a, a line in a poem. It's not. Right. And so you have to couch it in the drama and you have to utilize the language, but also you're looking at the form. Right. And you're also looking at this as a framing device and speaking about how it relates to the rest of the play. That's important. Let's take another example here. And I mentioned writing style a while ago. Now, this is actually from unit two, um, but I think it's important uh, that we look at it just because it's here as an example. And, it, you know, the, the value or benefit can can, can um, come out of it nevertheless. So the, the green section represents a student who is um, writing in a more sophisticated manner. And I'm leaving it on the screen for you for a while, just because it, there's a, there are a lot of words going on right there, right? So you can get a chance to read through, but I'm going to read through aspects of it for you also, right? And this is when you're looking at how you are representing the genre. OK, now this is again on drama and I've chosen drama because I find that students um, tend not to talk about, write about drama in the same ways um, that they do for poetry, for example. Um, and sometimes um, you can have a great essay, but because they're they're lacking in the use of language related to the genre of drama, there is a bit of a disconnect and, and a problem. And so it reduces the overall quality of your essay. So students, for example, just in looking at these challenges will say, you know, again, I've, I've really written, I, I thought I wrote a really good essay. I really got into it. I really poured out this content. The question is really not if you were accurate. That's really not the question. The question is, 
is the quality of what you represented um, helping you, serving you, okay? So how you write, again, not just the fact that you've written it, the, the concept may be there, but how you write, the calculated, strategic, accurate, informed way in which you have written, utilizing the vocabulary terms as related to the genre makes a difference. By now, you should have been able to read through those two. So let's look at the first line of the one on the left, okay? Ruth is kind-hearted overall, but because of Walter's issues, she comes across as being very bitter. That makes sense, doesn't it? Absolutely, it makes sense. I can relate to that. I think that's true. Um, that's fine. Let's look at the other side. And, and though the student is, is saying it um, differently and saying something a bit different, let's look at the use of language. Focus with me now on the language. Characterization is heavily used by the playwright Lorraine Hansberry in her depiction of the Black American family in the 1950s to indicate the love among family members despite the poverty and racism the unit faces. Did, did you feel that? <laughs> okay. You can feel the difference with that. The, the weighting is going to be different with that response. The truth of the matter is both students could have the same opinion. They could feel the same way about Ruth. It's how the student is bringing that across that is making the difference. Look at the use of the word characterization. What is that doing? That's immediately telling me that that student is aware that the lines, the first three lines that are written on the left, Ruth is kind-hearted, blah, 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 is really saying or speaking of characterization. It's providing details. What the students on the left has done is not really provided a general standpoint first. So that point kind of can go anywhere. Just look at it. It can go anywhere. I can begin to talk about her marriage. I can begin to talk about her in Black America. I can begin to talk about uh, what, you know, her as a woman, um, you know, and, and, and all of these different things, her, her relationship with mama, I can begin to go anywhere with the one in green. I can't go anywhere. I can't go just anywhere. I'm focused on characterization, right? Because that's how I've started it. And you know, the deal because you know, topic sentences and you know what they do, but that first sentence you make is always going to be important because it needs to be wide enough to accommodate for your ideas, but narrow enough to point me to what you're going to be speaking about in that paragraph. And so what happens with the one in the green is look at where Ruth comes in. Ruth, for example, and continues, right? Who is the wife of Walter and the mother of Travis displays her kind and loving personality to the audience when she appears with her son, Travis. Can you see what has happened? All right, by being able to start in that general way first, though specifically on characterization, that writer, this student has caused me to recognize immediately where he or she is going. Okay, I know that generally this paragraph or maybe two or three will be focused on characterization. Her main point, his main point here is on characterization. The issue of Ruth comes in as textual evidence. So the student has provided an opinion, is clarifying and explaining the opinion, and then is moving into the textual evidence and discussing that textual evidence based on the opinion that has been provided. A huge difference very important. Notice too that because it is genre specific, there is no writer, author, poet, there is playwright. Okay, and I know you know the difference between a playwright and a poet, but what I'm saying and the point I'm making is you could have just said writer. By doing by by using the word playwright, you're causing the examiner to understand that you know the terminology of drama, right? And this is what this is about. Your exam is demonstrating that paper that you will submit as demonstrating that you know you're able to apply and that you have a response that is deep not just superficial and you know something that you could get from anybody when you're doing a vox pop on the street right it's informed because you have been educated and trained and taught in a certain way okay let's move from that point i hope that point has been made <clears throat> so i think we've covered the writing essays on the different genres right in terms of just looking at generally why it's important um, let me make sure I, I say this, though. Um, 
that fourth point there, we've already touched the first three points, right? Knowing the difference among the genres we just dealt with and the evidence that will show that to you, all right? Um, you will need to speak of ideas related to <clears throat> literary criticism. That's important. All right, so let's see how this works. Um, we, we touched on this before. When you're looking at the different genres, you want to begin to bring in what others have said about the genre as well. So there are specific comments that may be made about a particular technique or device. You want to focus on that. You want to look at how the characters are in the novel, for example, are utilized or talked about by certain literary critics. What is said about them? So you have your opinion and you've noted your opinion, but then you can speak to what others have said. Sometimes you may not remember the names. If you can remember the names, that would be great, okay? Sometimes you can't remember the names and you might want to say that there are some literary critics who speak of blah, blah, blah. The important thing is to know that argument. What you're doing is bringing depth and soundness to whatever it is you're discussing and demonstrating that you have studied uh, uh, this work. You have studied um, this novel, these poems, um, this play. And with the poetry, it's, it's even more so important because you're looking at a, a particular poet and you really should cover all aspects of that poet as you try to engage with whatever it is that the content is being shared on, on poetry. All right, let's move back. So I am hoping you got across this point and I'm bringing across certain points that at the end of the day, if you forget everything, you can press replay. But at the end of the day, if you forget everything, there are certain things that I want to stand out. You can have an accurate answer, okay? And still not manage to get the grade that you desire to get, that grade one, that grade two, because of how you express that answer. OK, so having the accurate and, and here's the difference. And I find, again, it, it differs because of the subject, um, the subject differences of students. So, so you may find that in some subject areas, you can get away with just giving that knowledge. The student is able to tell you that they know this and they can show that with literature. It's not simply about what you know, but how you express what you know and how you engage with what you know. They need to see that engagement because that engagement is what is demonstrating that critical thinking, that critical consciousness that they're looking for. So how you express that answer can e either, you know, increase or decrease um, the quality of your response. All right. So you want to find a balanced way. Know the text, know about the text, be able to talk about the story or the poem or the play. And at the same time, know how you are going to manage that argument that you're going to present on it. Very important. So let's move on. And we're going to look quickly at three important challenges and possible solutions. Okay. So students um, will come to the, the exam question issue, figuring out the exam question. And that's usually challenge one. And students have written and said things like, I am not always certain about what the question is asking, right? And this, these are things that we'd have dealt with in certain workshops, okay? And so when you look at um, that idea, the next move to make is, the first thing is you have to have a clear understanding of the specifications of each question, okay? You have to know what question what question is happening? What, what question is, is going on here? And how, how am I going to unpack that question? Is it, if it's related to poetry, what are the specifications surrounding poetry, right? Um, what, are the, what, what are the instructions surrounding um, section C of the paper? Um, be, and, and I'm saying this because it seems simple on one hand, but if you get into the exam, even though the instructions are still there, if you get in the exam without a confidence, not just kind of, oh, I think that's what it says, a confidence about the specifications of the questions, then what will happen is it, it, it will cause you to know immediately, this is what I must do, this is what I have to do. So when you're looking at poetry, for example, and, and the question is based on a selected poet, you can't just go in there and and put the man's name. We're going to do Wilfred Owen tomorrow, I understand, Dr. Michael Bucknell. 
you can't just go in there and say, okay, the poems by Wilfred Owen show that there is, and you go, you can't get away with that. <laughs> you have to demonstrate that you know this man, right? That you're in tune with the context surrounding him, that you understand the type of poetry that is being written, the era out of which that poem has come, the features of that type of poetry based on Owen, but also based on the time frame in which these poems were written. You have to demonstrate that. Even before you begin the question, you need to know that. So whatever question comes, that's a given. So even before you get that paper that you're about to get in June, that question is gonna, you have to deal with that, right? You are going to get a question in Owen. You must know the background. You must know the context, not only of, of, of who the poet is, but how, what surrounds the poet, what information, what, what situation surrounds the poet. Um, I think I have a question that I'm going to look at shortly um, that one of you probably submitted, but I will look at that shortly as I, as I, as I go through, okay? Um, section A, complete one question from one play. So some students um, would have done one play, some students might have done two, and so they can choose, right? If you have done two plays and you can choose, right? Never decide beforehand that you're only going to do this one and you're not going to look at that one, <laughs> okay? Even if you think you don't like it. I say to students all the time, you know, you can, can, you can see me, right? And you may not like me, but you are able to appreciate me. Think about it, right? You, you, you don't have to like everybody and like everything, but you can be able to speak about, well, you know, this is what she did and this is what she said. Or if it's a thing, you can look at, well, you know, I, 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 I like the way that this happens. And in truth, that, that story really reflects blah, blah, blah. And, and I wouldn't know about Black issues. I wouldn't know about African-American issues if I had not read this play. Those things come about, you don't have to like it. But if you know about it, and if you can appreciate the qualities, you can write about it, right? So don't, you want to be able to connect with anything that you are doing. You must connect, right? Because that's a part of your response. But it's important that you kind of get into a, a situation of, 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 of knowing um, I can handle this. Like whatever comes, once I deal with these things as written out by the syllabus, as stated by the syllabus, I can handle this. What makes you able to handle it? You. That's what makes you able to handle it, right? Seriously. It, it's about your response and you need to cultivate a response. So let's take this other example just before I go further um, quickly and I need to watch the time as well because I'll get excited and get carried away, right? Um, so if you look at it, um, if you have a, a, a situation where you, you are going to, to, to deal with a particular text, um, you already come to this with a certain degree of knowledge, all right? You already have some basics in, in, in the in the understanding of knowledge. This is why practice is important, guys, because here's the deal. If you don't practice having an opinion, let us say we have, and I have many students like that at the university, um, and they'll tell me all the time, we always start with a little introduction thing. I'm shy, I don't like to speak, I don't really speak in front of other people, you know, that kind of thing. So, so let's say that you have a situation where you never speak. And so as far as you're concerned, you're shy and introverted, which by the, the way, doesn't mean as some of you will know that you can't speak, right? And you just don't speak because you haven't practiced it. And it's, it's you know, let's say that's you. So, so, you know, I'm shy, I don't speak and you never practice it. Does it mean you can't uh, do a 30 minute presentation in front of an audience of 400 people? Absolutely not. What it does mean is that you have to practice doing that because if you dare with all the shyness and introversion and all the nervousness that everybody will always feel at the start of anything like that, if you go into it like that, what is automatically going to happen is you have no habits, you have no pattern, you don't know where to go, what to do, what are the weaknesses, what are the strengths, what do I look out for? This is what happens with the question specifications. You must know them. Know that for the prose fiction, it's one Caribbean and one American, British or post-colonial. And I'm sure your teachers have sorted you out with that, okay? But then when you're, when you're studying and, and trying to prepare for it, which you're doing now, think about what is already common in both, but still distinct. 
in both. So when you're looking at the Caribbean and the American texts, they've been put together for a reason, guys, right? The British and the Caribbean, these texts have been chosen because of the similarities and differences. And you're going to end up going straight back to that how, because though the content may be similar, though it may have a female protagonist, though it may utilize first person narrative, etc., cetera, there are different things that are going to be different contrasting even all right and you want to be able to negotiate with that you can't do that just by reading the text and saying yeah man i know that uh whereas uh, that one is a bildungsroman i i know that's an epistolary you know and you kind of trying to find it get to it right now make that list create that list now and then practice writing about it because what happens when you start that sentence, you can't finish it, right? Which so many students say happens to them over and over. Great point. Uh, do I need to keep talking about it? Yes, okay? So you come up with this great point, but you have to practice talking about it, practice writing about it, and start with talking first, and then begin to get it down in writing. So know your spe specifications and rehearse this before the exam, guys. That's very important. All right, let's move forward. Let's look at this question quickly. All right. Um, if we look at with reference to one Caribbean and one British American or post-colonial work of fiction that you've studied, discuss ways in which writers use narrative techniques to explore the issue of alienation. Now, I'm not going to dwell too long on this because I know you guys have done this thing a million times. This is a free online speci specimen paper. But look at the difference in colors there with what I've highlighted. All right. The tendency is we underline, right? You've been taught to underline. I'm pop pretty positive. So you underline, okay, these are the key terms. What ends up happening is you underline everything. So everything is important, okay? But where do you go with that? How do you move with that? Um, what you've realized here is these different things are actually different, telling me different ways I have to approach the question. I have to look at the question, all right? So one Caribbean and one British, we got that, all right? But then it says, discuss, Look back to your syllabus and you look at all of those lists of terms that they give you. You need to know all of them, comment, outline, explain, explore, discuss. Those things are important, okay? Because you need to know when you touch discuss that you cannot be just presenting one point of view. You need to know that when you discuss, you have to give a balanced appreciation of the, the possibilities of both sides of something. You need to give a whole scale discussion, right? So go through those terms, they're all there, right? Go through those terms in the syllabus and make sure you're aware of what each implies. That's one side of things. Then it says ways. So you're discussing ways. Is this looking at how? It absolutely is. OK, so you need to be you become familiar with that and flesh this out for yourself. What's your understanding of ways? You quickly jot that down. If the question and you, if you feel the question is not accessible immediately, there's no problem with that. We all express ourselves different ways. We agree with that, I'm sure. Right. And so what will happen is as I go through how I express it, you some if we were having a conversation, you would say, can you say that again? But you can't say that to the examiner, okay? You can't say that to the person who has set the paper, right? So what you do is unpack. You begin to unpack it and you begin to say, all right, here is what it's saying. And then you rephrase it for yourself and look at it, write it down on your rough paper so you can see for yourself that rephrasing so that inside what's happening, remember we are human beings, you know, there's a physiological thing happening here. Instead of the brain going, oh my gosh, I'm about to fail this exam. There is no way I can do this. The brain starts to go, oh, so that's what it's saying, <laughs> right? Because you unpack it and you rephrase it. Writers use, that use word is very important. It's not just the presentation of narrative techniques that's, be, that's being looked at in this question. It's the idea of using how do the writers use the narrative techniques? So you have to identify the narrative techniques, but you also have to look at how it's being used. All right. Exploring is this other word here. What does it mean to explore? You have to get into that, unpack that. OK, so we have an idea of explore, but are you going to look deeply into? Are you going to um examine carefully, whatever you want to put as, as your definition, hopefully it's aligning with the dictionary definition some way, right? But the point is your understanding of it will help you to better write that essay rather than you keep looking at the question only and explore ends up being this abstract thing in your mind, okay? And then alienation is the theme, 
right? So we recognize that everything there is basically coming together to say that I need to demonstrate how these two writers, these two novelists, these two authors dis, um, uh, demonstrate different ways that they use particular narrative techniques to look into, analyze, talk about the issue of alienation. Do you see all I just did there? And we could easily go on for another 50 minutes, okay? Just on that. So unpack the question, guys. That's going to be important. Read it at least three times. Underline the terms. Remind yourself of the words. Decipher what it's asking and rephrase it. Determine your stance. Do you agree with this? Right? Look at your core feeling immediately. Remember how you connect with the question first. If, you, for example, you see the question, you say, boy, this is the only question I can do, but I don't like it. I don't like this question, <laughs> right? You have to connect with that. Why don't you like it? Okay, you know, you may not like it because you have a problem with the character. Not liking it is not an issue. That's really not an issue. The only issue is, can you speak about it? Can you talk about it? Can you discuss the issue at hand? All right. And that's part of literature, being able to look at different sides of the coin without feeling the need to bash down any, any one side. All right. So be strategic again, because that is what is on show here. Um, how do you have a well-structured essay? All right. So students will say, look, I have whole heap of ideas, but I can't really get to structuring the essay. All right. Um, we all know, and I'm, I'm looking at this very quickly because I think you have gone over a million times, I'm sure, the actual outline of the essay, right? And let me just skip to this slide quickly. Introduction, body, conclusion. We know this, okay? We got this, right? A clear thesis that relates the core central main idea and your stance and the direction of your analysis. An informed, look at those words, please. Those words are not there by mistake. Look up every one of those words when you're finished here. Informed. What does sensitive mean? Sensitive, if I'm sensitized to something, you know, I know everything about it, right? You, you don't have to tell me. I, I know how it works. I know how it operates. I'm in tune with it, right? So any question that comes on that, I got it because I know it inside out. That's what being sensitive to it means, right? Well-balanced, we just looked at. An argument that is coherent, and we'll come to that shortly, means that it's flowing. Everything is flowing together. Sound logic. And simply put, it means it needs to make sense. <laughs> okay? The argument has to make sense. Like, even if I don't agree with it, I have to look at it and be able to say, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. That, that, yeah, I can see, right? You just need to make the other person aware of the fact that this, this can work. This, this interpretation can work, right? And an interpretation is my reading of that text and having this informed opinion about it, all right? And then moving from that to demonstrate it, how I arrived at this, that's what your analysis is doing. This is how I arrived at this thought, this opinion, this interpretation of the text. And an analysis means to break down. So I'm breaking it down for you, how I got there right? Which is why it has to be clear, which is why you have to have well-developed paragraphs. And then you come to the end, right? And I know for some of you, the end means, oh my goodness, uh, got to get in this last point. No, <laughs> right? If that's what you're going to do, stop it, right? And try to chuck that last point somewhere in that body, but not in the conclusion. Because in the conclusion, you want to demonstrate that I know what I'm saying, and now I'm wrapping it up and I'm handing it back to you. And what you really are saying is I'm handing it back to you. I would like my grade one, <laughs> right? Because you've pulled everything so wonderfully together. And look at the syllabus wording again. Guys, the wording in the syllabus is really very important, okay? It says provide a reasonable close. So if you're providing a reasonable close based on supporting the argument, then it means you're pulling everything together and representing that logical thought. OK, and saying this is what my final product is. This is what I'm saying. Here is the overview of everything I've just said in one. OK, so no new thoughts can go there. That's very important. All right. And then quickly, knowing how to write a critical appreciation type essay, not a kind of English A persuasive essay. And I think that's really what a lot of students confuse it with. Or an English B where you've had A, B, C items. And so you're kind of looking, they're not going to give me any A, B, and C for this, right? No, right? You are now at an advanced level where you're expected to bring your argument home. 
all right? You're expected to know what you need to do to present this argument in a way that somebody is going to be interested in a sustained way for the whole of your essay. You keep me going from thought to thought. So students often say that some of us really struggle with putting it all together. That's understandable. Try to create a formula for yourself. Have you stated your point? Have you explained your point? Have you expanded on your point? That could be a formula for you, right? For you to remember, I need to bring in literary critics there. I need to bring in textual evidence as support, but I need to first, before I do anything, I must state my point. What is my point? I can't start with just going into examples because then the reader won't have an understanding of where I am. So you need to state your point. You need to develop that point. And then you need to have a look quickly at what textual evidence is being used to support that or what literary critics have said to support that. Quickly, if you just look at this, right, and look at the idea of sentences, paragraphs, and sections, really it's a buildup. OK, it's a build up. And so you have your sentences, which must flow into each other. And you have you have a situation of your paragraphs where your paragraphs must move according to these, you know, transitional words. Um, you, you can move from your and, and cues. I know you know these and you move into your, your paragraph. So think of it always as you're reading. It's an exam and, and the examiners know you're under test conditions. But as you're reading, keep reading. Does this sentence flow into this sentence neatly? Does this sentence make sense based on what came before it and what will come after it? And then for my paragraphs, have I isolated my thoughts into different paragraphs so that there is a clarity when the reader reads from the starting sentence, which is your topic sentence straight in. Clearly your thesis is going to be there and your thesis is going to give the, the direction of your essay, the points that you're planning to make, right? And the stance that you have. So that's going to be clear. I know you know how to write your thesis statements already. All right. And that will be in your introduction. But as you move through, the rest of your sentences and paragraphs have to be fluent. So sometimes the rush is, let me just show them that I know the text. But that plays against you because the expression of what you know is just as important as what you know. And sometimes the quality for the student falls, not because what they know is not there, but because of how they're representing what they know, all right? And then you pour all of that into the three sections of the essay, okay? So I'm going to, this is an example quickly of the narrative techniques, all right? This is an example of those narrative techniques and how you could look at three different points. And my suggestion is that you look at three different points. Um, I... I, I I know, so for example, let's just have, say you have a discussion where you want to bring in a balance of points. You could look at two points here and two points there. You have to know what you can manage, but my suggestion is you never go below three, all right? Uh, but three is kind of the standard and the accepted. If you feel you can hit four points and do that in the time and do it well and organized, go ahead. But my suggestion is three, C3 as, as what you're, you're aiming for. And this would just, this is just an idea of how Auntie Jen, Aunt Jen, not Auntie Jen, Aunt Jen and, and Purple Hibiscus could have been pulled together. Um, that comparative essay will be important as well. All right. And looking at it again, start from the points of similarity and then use that to show the distinction that is present for each. Almost closing now, right? Um, so three things I want you to remember based on everything that we've been discussing. Style, how you write. You need to know yourself. You need to know how you write and what to look out for, right? Um, what you write is informed and influenced by your wide reading. And the syllabus speaks to that. Read widely. And yes, you still have enough time because if you do it strategically, you read different points and jot them down under the themes, okay? So going into the essay is not simply about knowing there must be an intro, body, and conclusion. Believe me, I would say 95% of students know that, and they still come out not quite satisfied because it's not just the structure, but it's merging myself with that structure, okay? And so you're looking at the style, you're also looking at the structure, okay? Um, how you organize what you write. So we've done that, we've touched on that, but remember, it's a sound line of argument. So there has to be fluency of thought. It can't be that you're just jumping all over the place and saying, oh yeah, that, that theme brings, oh yeah, that brings, mm -mm. everything has to connect, 
okay? What are you saying about the issue? And guys, that's where your expression matters. You need to have opinions, and I'm sure you do, but you need to get them out, right? And get them out in a way without having to cuss off everybody, right? So instead of focusing on on trying to, 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 um, to kind of throw out a thing for people to, you better believe what I have to say, more see it like, well, what do I have to say? And how do I actually feel about this? Because that personal connection is important for the exam, okay? So sentence flow, paragraph development, textual evidence, and this logical flow of thoughts. And finally, though not exhaustively, substance. The truth is many students don't know what else to write because they haven't read widely and because they have not cultivated their opinion. Cultivating my opinion means I don't just have the opinion, but I develop it. I practice developing it, okay? And that state, explain, expand, must work for all the ideas in my mind. What is my point? Not the example from the text, the point, right? So don't just get into retelling the story. What is the point on the story, right? And know the difference between summarizing the text and restating what is already in the text and actually having an opinion, okay? That's in line with the focus of the question, the knowledge of the text, the application of that literary criticism. Bring in your literary theory, all right? And, and a literary study of text is mentioned in the syllabus. And people don't, what, what that's essentially saying is there's a lot involved with studying the text. It's not just reading because you're going reading, interpreting, responding. That's a process. And you have to support that and build that up for yourself. Okay, so I am going to close out to allow you to, to, to um, I think you've posed some questions and I want to answer them quickly. Um, I think I've spoken to that already. I want to say that you need to give it your best, guys, and, and that you have it. You have it. You, you have the information. You can do this. And you don't want to offer a submission, which someone has to kind of say, what point are you making again? You want to make a submission where somebody says, oh, my gosh, this person, she, she or he has touched everything here, right? This is a great thing. This is a great discussion. All right. So thanks for listening. And viewing and good luck in your exams. Let me go now to answering some of those questions quickly if I can. All right. So let's see here. And thank you so much for participating, those of you who have asked. Oh, I have quite a bit of questions here. Okay. How many points should be discussed in an essay? Um, I think I I think I think answered that already. I suggest three points, okay? Um, if you have a situation where you're giving, um, you know, a counter argument kind of situation where you're giving two points on one side and two points, I suggest that's, that's easily handled by aver the average student. Um, work it out, you know, you, that's why you need to practice. You need to know how long it takes you to really get into certain questions and answers, okay? Um, and how long it takes you to get your points across and time yourself, please guys create a plan for your essay. And I know you've done the plan already. So if you notice, I didn't focus on the things that I thought you do all the time. Um, I really focused on the substance parts of the essay that people tend to, to forget. Um, a question I think is Shania. Thank you for that question. I hope I pronounced your name right. Is it really necessary to give background information? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, it's very necessary. It's absolutely necessary. Here is why. Don't see background information as just, you know, you trying to robotically say, yeah, yeah, I know this. Back, think about it. If you're going to introduce me, how do you introduce me and not talk about my background? Where would you go with that? My background has everything to do with who I am. Doesn't yours, right? So think about it. So if, if I came out of a particular culture and society and, and, and I'm a woman and, and I'm a black woman and I have two kids, those things matter because my writing is coming out of, of my life, right? So you think about it like that. Background information doesn't just have to be in the introduction where you just throw down information and say, okay, and this point was warning, mm -hmm, right? That's important. You must place and contextualize and place. Background information also comes in in my content, in my points, in my points, right? So if I'm writing on a, about a poem and I'm making a particular point and that point has to do with the idea of uh, the treatment I've received as the treatment being received by the persona as woman, then how could that background not matter, right? That needs to come into it. And if it's a man writing, it still matters. What is it that could have led that 
poet to, to talking about that. And there's a difference between persona and poet. And the syllabus speaks to that as well. It's important that you know it. Don't always refer to the poet as the persona because we know that's not always the case. And that's just an aside. So yes, Shania, definitely background information is important for everything, not just the play, the poem and the prose fiction piece. Chanel, what do you think a student can do if they have a problem structuring the, the essay strategically? Um, if that is the case, I think um, immediately one of the things you have to do is, is decide what works best for you. How do you come up with points naturally? If you start with the example, for example, if, if you come up with points by, oh, I get an example first, then work your way backwards. You get an example, what's the point of this example? What am I gonna use this example to say? And so wherever you start off, that's natural for you, that's what you should do. That's where you should work, work with that. Um, but then at the same time, um, be, be aware. That's why you have to know yourselves, guys, and you have to know your style. Be aware of what you're saying and how you're matching what you're saying. So strategy, um, in, in all fairness with that, that question, strategy is not just based on you. Strategy is also based on the expectation of the examiner, what expectation the examiner has of you. So start with you and how you naturally do things and match that to what the expectation is and ensure that you practice that. So when you go in the exam, you can move a Accordingly. I hope that somehow answers the question. I know we can't get into the full thing of that. Um, I'll leave my email address so you can email me after. Um, I hope I haven't missed any questions. My mouse is jumping. There's a question from Solana. Solana, I hope I haven't messed up that beautiful name there. Any suggestions on how to complete all S's within the time? Some of us can't and don't. Here's my thoughts on that. We don't because we don't practice enough. That's the truth. So it, it is difficult. And who wants to write in a contained way? Those of us who love to write, okay? But we have to, because this is what is set up. So the, the idea is practice and know yourself and have, you know, I, I don't think you're allowed to bring smartwatches, but you certainly should be able to bring a regular watch in, right? Have a sense of the time. And usually there's a clock in the exam room that you can look at and, and know for you, but you have to know this before the exam. How do you, how much time do you usually spend um, getting the question, you know, unpacked, rephrasing that question. So maybe I'll spend five minutes on the question. I'll spend five minutes planning, then the rest for the essay. Um, I spent too long on the introduction because I'm watching the time. But you have to do that based on how much time you tend to take. So time yourself and see where you are with 45 minutes. Time yourself and see where you are with 50 minutes, okay? And then you will know what needs to happen, what I need to hurry up with. Um, some of us as just daydreaming stuff. All right. And so we get really worked up um, and then we start drifting off. OK, maybe I can write about maybe I can. But then we don't get writing. You have to be, just get the writing going as soon as you've made your plan. OK, um, let's go down. I think I've done that. Um, I'm seeing a question from Miss Archer. I'm trying my best to get to it. Is Have I left out? So Alicia, how many points should be discussed? I've discussed that already. Okay, um, Ms. Arsha, can you address how a student may address incorporating the counter argument point in the essay? The superior writer may identify a point that may seem to derail her essay, but she can address and incorporate to her. Let me start with the first, right? Make sure. Can you address how a student may address incorporating the counter argument point in the essay? All right, so once you have a flow of thought, right? What you automatically, and this is why wide reading is important, because if I'm thinking a particular way and I have a thought, immediately because I've already read everything and in my plan when I'm just jotting down my ideas or even before my plan when I might want to just throw down everything that's in my mind, that's something I would want to do immediately. What you can begin doing is think about every time you come up with a point, you remember, okay, but so-and-so actually goes against that, right? Um, so although... Um, Sarah Ferguson has, has, has stated blah, 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 blah. When we look at the poetry of blah, 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 blah. So what I've done is I've spoken of the counterpoint already, right? And made the examiner aware that I know this point exists. You can do counterpoints in different ways. You can include them in different ways. So you can, I'm sure if you look that up, you can see how to, to approach the dealing with, with, with counterpoints. But if, if you want to look at, you can, you can, Insert it at the start. You can insert it in the middle. What I want to say to you, um, Ms., is that 
you have to do it naturally. Let it sound natural. Let it be a part of your arguments and discussion. Like you're, you're talking to somebody and you want to get it across. Do not write your essay the way we talk. Okay. That's not what I'm saying. But in other words, you want it to flow naturally. So sometimes it may be okay at the start and other times based on how you've written and what you've written, it may not fit in. And so you want to try and distinguish that for yourself. Um, how to bring across your own opinions as the use of personal pronouns is discouraged. So, Salisha, quickly on that, um, and, and I, I understand that, what you can do is you're distancing yourself but keeping your point. So just, again, this is practice, right? So this is what I think. So, so I would say um, the, the situation of... Um, of, of betrayal, or let, let's talk about the situation of sexism um, as, as present in the taming of the true. Um, and I, I, in other words, that's, that's how I feel, but I never say I, right? And so you keep distancing it just a little bit, not too much, because you want the tone to be yours. You want the style of writing to be yours, but you don't want to get into things like, and you should and it is important that you should, you know, students tend to get into that you use of pronoun too easily. And you clearly, you know, you don't want to have the, the, the constant use of the I, even though I suspect in times coming that will eventually go. All right. So try to just distance it as though you are presenting this information, but you don't want to sound biased. And so you're presenting this information to a group of people and you don't want them to know who you are, but it's the same ideas and the same points and you refrain from, from using the personal pronouns. But can I tell you very, that, that Salisha, that is heavily practiced. So keep, keep at it and look for models online. There are good models online that you can utilize and you can look at, if you know you struggle with constantly bringing in you, for example, when you should be talking about the reader or the audience, you can look at different things online and just literally, you know, how can you keep, replace the word you, um, that kind of thing. So you can get some strategies there. Uh, violin, what's a beautiful name? Um, does the three point paragraph essay go for the dual text in the drama in unit two? And I'm saying yes, um, depending on how you write your essay, if you know you want to compare through particular points. So if you're making one point on both texts, right? You're, you're going to end up discussing both texts in one point. So you'll have three points that will discuss both texts. And that to me is one of the easier ways to do it. Um, and, and, and also it, it just helps you to, to, to maintain structure. It's, it's when you have to discuss two texts, I know it's hard for some of you, but some of, some of the time, if you discuss one text all by itself and then one text all by itself, sometimes what ends up happening is you end up repeating yourself and, and you end up giving mundane information information. Remember, it's an argument. So you want to try to look at that theme or that idea that is in the question on both texts and try to look at the points based on the idea first in the question and then look at how it happens in both texts. So kind of like a triangular thing where the main point is here and you branch off into talking about this text and branch off into talking about that text. And sometimes they may intertwine, right? The important thing is that you demonstrate knowledge. Hope that helps you, Valen. Um, Markela, I hope that's right. How many points do you suggest for the drama essay? I don't, I don't suggest different points for different genres, um, for different essays for different genres. I suggest three points across the board and where you have to have this kind of counter argument. You can do two, two. Some students can manage three, three, but I think the average is two, two or three points in total across the board. That's what I suggest. I think I have managed to go through all questions. I hope you found today useful. Um, and, um, let me just, um, I'm going to give you my email address. Um, it's a I S H a dot S P E N C E R at U W I Mona dot E D U dot jm all right so you can send me a word send me a question if you have it once i have the time i'll get back to you on that thank you so much for joining us for this second presentation on the cape lecture series and thanking dr rochelle mosleywood for inviting me to be with you and guide you through today